Hello, everyone. Um, thank, welcome to North Brooklyn Night School. Uh, my name is Jorge. My pronouns are he, him. Um, you know, North Brooklyn Night School is a very important part of the political education of, you know, North Brooklyn's branch of the New York City chapter of DSA. And we do this every other Tuesday. You know, we have readings and hoping to uh, meet, in per meet in person soon. Uh, this is the second session of the fall semester of night school. First one was two weeks ago what, on what is socialism. And today is, you know, a very important question um, that, you know, if you, you all want to be a socialist, it's important to understand well, what is capitalism, right? You know, capitalism is like, what is the system that uh, I would assume everyone that's a socialist is opposed to um, and wants to replace? So, you know, it's extremely important that we, that we as socialists and organizers and are also as much as we commit ourselves to organizing, we commit ourselves to broadening our, our minds and, and structuring our thinking. And this is why political education is so important. We, need, we must be able to understand the world in order to be able to change it. Um, speaker today is uh, David Kotz. You know, David Kotz is a professor emeritus of economics and senior research fellow in the Political e Economy Research Institute at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. He is member of the River Valley DSA chapter in Western Massachusetts, the DSA International Committee, and the DSA National Political Education Committee. He is the author of the book, The Rise and Fall of Neoliberal Capitalism, published by Harvard University Press. Thank you for coming, Professor. Okay, I'm very glad to uh, be here and to see all of you uh, two-dimensional rectangles, uh, which is uh, what you get in the Zoom era, but it's better than nothing. Uh, I'd, uh, uh, I plan to uh, do a presentation in which you are encouraged to raise a question at any point if you have one. Uh, Carrington, what's, or Jorge, what is the usual method you use for raising a question? Is it the raise hand function or putting something in the chat? What have you been using? Uh, we typically have used stack. Stack, okay. Well, I'll try to keep an eye on the chat, but uh, I can't always look at uh, two things at once. Uh, so if you, if you put, if you wanna raise a question and you put stack in there and I don't see it, you could raise, uh, you could use the raise hand function. If your video's on, you could also wave your hand because I'll probably see that. If all else fails, you can shout out, I have a question, okay? Or a comment. Because uh, I do want to encourage people to uh, raise questions. Uh, during, when I'm presenting, I'll probably want to finish my sentence, but then I'll call on you. Uh, and uh, there will also be some, uh, a few times I'm going to throw out a discussion question. And then uh, please use the raise hand or the or stack in the chat if you'd like to respond to a discussion question. And at some point about midway through, I plan to uh, break the group down into very small breakout rooms to discuss a question that I will pose to you. Uh, okay, I think that's all the preliminaries, except uh, uh, let me, I'm going to, uh, you're going to be afflicted with PowerPoint, I'm afraid. Uh, so let me share the screen. Okay, can people uh, see the PowerPoint? Carrington, I can see you and a few others. Just shake your head yes or something if you can see it. Okay. Uh, let me uh, rearrange things a little bit here. And okay, my presentation is is about capitalism. I have my uh, email address on this slide. If you wanted to ask a follow up question or comment, uh, feel free to email me. Uh, and the uh, the PowerPoint slides will be made uh, available to people after after the class. Now, uh, Marx's Capital uh, has long been viewed as a key book for socialists uh, to study since the 19th century, since it was uh, written in the 19th century, which raises the question, uh, Marx was focused on bringing socialism to replace capitalism, yet he spent decades in the British Museum uh, researching and writing about capitalism. Uh, why have socialists historically believed it was important to really 
uh, come to an understanding of capitalism when uh, it's socialism that they were really interested in. Would anyone like to uh, hazard a uh, suggestion about why? I'm looking at the, at the chat. I mean, why not just talk about socialism? David Diaz. <clears throat> well, I think uh, one of the reasons was that, um, you know, Marx was influenced by the French utopic, or what he referred to as the utopian socialists. Right. Um, so socialism wasn't invented by Marx, first and foremost. I think he espoused uh, what he and Engels termed um, uh, scientific socialism. So he wanted to draw upon the insights of Hegelian dialectics, although from a materialist perspective, um, and deploy it as, in my understanding, obviously I'm not an expert, but I mean, and deploy it to, to an analysis of capitalism, but starting from the key concepts of capitalism. And that's why he, he paid a close attention of classical British political economy. But I think the genius of Marx is that he deployed, you know, uh, his dialectical analysis and, you know, deeply influenced by, you know, German philosophy at the time into the realm of British political economy, um, if that makes sense. And for him, I think it was important to do an ideological critique of capitalism if to understand that it's an internal dynamic and to see what are some of the tendencies and potentialities for socialism that are inherent in, in the system. I think it's called imminent critique, if, I'm, if, I, if I recall correctly. Thank you. Yes, uh, a, uh, Marx uh, believed that uh, the potential for capitalism, that discerning uh, what forces within capitalism were leading toward a transition to socialism would be uh, crucial for the socialist movement to identify, understand, and utilize in helping to bring that transition about. Uh, so uh, today uh, I will introduce some key ideas about capitalism uh, derived from that book and some from uh, later studies in the Marxist tradition as capitalism has evolved over time in certain ways. Some of the ideas I'm going to introduce are explicitly found in Marx's Capital. Others of them are implicit in that analysis. And uh, the aim is not just to develop an understanding of capitalism, but to shed light on the urgent question of how to move beyond it. Uh, here's an outline of uh, the parts of my presentation. First, the defining features of capitalism, a short answer to what is it, uh, and then uh, a longer examination of the key relation of capitalism, the exploitation of labor, uh, including you know, what, what are its uh, roots, what are its consequences. Uh, third, uh, look briefly at some non-class forms of oppression in the capitalist era. And then last, a very brief concluding comment. Uh, my, uh, this class today is intended to form a basis for the diverse topics that I see are coming up in the succeeding uh, Socialist Night School sessions. So uh, the defining features of capitalism. Uh, in the Marxist tradition, there are three. First, capitalism, as Marx put it, is a system of commodity production. And at the time Marx wrote, the term uh, commodity and the way he used it uh, was not a reference to things like wheat or corn, uh, but it referred to things that are produced for the purpose of sale, uh, not for self-use, not for giving to others. That's what uh, commodities meant. So a system of commodity production meant uh, a market economy. Uh, however, capitalism is more than a market economy. In the uh, mainstream economics or neoclassical uh, approach to economics, uh, they don't really have a concept of capitalism. They see the contemporary economic system as simply a market economy. But Marx emphasized that that was only one aspect and indeed an aspect that does not reveal the most important uh, features, the most important uh, ways that capitalism operates. The second feature, uh, is the wage labor relation. Uh, 
uh, in which owners of enterprises hire wage laborers to produce products for sale. The owners of the enterprises referred to as capitalists, they own the means of production, the factories, office buildings, etc., cetera, uh, machines, tools. <clears throat> Workers own no means of production and sell their ability to work to capitalists for a wage. And uh, third, the aim of production. Uh, the reason why capitalists go through this uh, procedure of uh, owning enterprises, hiring wage workers, producing products and selling them is to end up uh, with more than they began. Uh, just the other day on Sunday, I was reading the Sunday New York Times and I saw a quote from an executive of Moderna, the vaccine maker, in an article that was criticizing Moderna for uh, sending very few of their COVID vaccines to uh, low-income countries. And a high former official, a doctor at the CDC, Centers for Disease Control, was quoted as saying about Moderna, they are behaving as if they have absolutely no responsibility beyond maximizing the return on investments. Welcome to capitalism. That's what they're supposed to do. Of course, the fact that the cost of creating it may have been mostly borne by taxpayers, well, that's a detail. Uh, now, with those features in mind, uh, let me turn to the uh, concept of exploitation of labor, which is central to the Marxist understanding of capitalism. According to mainstream economics, the uh, labor and capital have a relation essentially of equality. They're seen as parallel. In fact, they're not really seen as even having a relationship. Uh, they're both, workers and capitalists are both seen as contributing something to production and each receives compensation uh, for what they contribute. Uh, the worker contributes labor in the language of mainstream economics and receives a wage. The capitalist contributes something they call capital, which really means investing money in production to buy capital goods, a workplace, et cetera. And the capitalist receives a payment in the form of profit, or sometimes it's called interest, depending on the context. Marx argued that it's workers who produce the means of production, the capitalists just own them. And so that raises the question, why does owning enterprises and capital goods lead to a flow of profit to the owners? The answer Marx put forward was that the capitalist appropriates, that is takes part of what the workers produce in the form of profit. The word appropriates in the late 19th century was a common word that simply meant to take. It has lived on today mainly in the language of uh, legislatures that are developing bills that they uh, are gonna pass that have to do with money. Now, uh, Marx notes that this raises a puzzle. In capitalism, workers are legally free. Capitalists cannot compel a worker to do anything. The worker can leave if the worker wishes. Uh, I mean, imagine if a capitalist confronted, uh, let's say a manager uh, confronted a worker who said, well, it's noon time halfway through my shift, but I've had it, I'm leaving. And imagine if the manager said, you can't do that. And the worker said, oh, yes, I can. The manager said, if you leave, I'm gonna call the cops. Have you arrested? Well, if the manager followed through on his threat and called the police, assuming the police knew the law, they would say, uh, excuse me, sir, we can't do that. And if the cop who answered the phone happened to have read Marx and understood Marxism, they would say, sir, you're confused about the mode of production here. This is capitalism. <laughs> Workers are legally free. I mean, you'll make out fine, don't worry, but this is not slavery or feudalism. You can't force a worker to work. Okay. Uh, in slave and feudal systems, uh, it, it, there was no puzzle as to how the master class uh, obtained uh, a flow of revenue from the labor of serfs or slaves. They could compel them to obey, but the capitalists 
can't literally do that. In Capital, Marx used a, an economic theory, the labor theory of value, to show how capitalists are able to take part of what workers produce. Now, Marx didn't invent the labor theory of value. Uh, it, it was the, the dominant theory among British economists in the late uh, 18th and early to mid 19th century. By the time Marx wrote, it was under challenge by the uh, neoclassical theory, which I won't go into here. But according to the labor theory of value, the value of a commodity when it is sold in exchange is determined by the hours required to produce it. That's a simple statement of it. Uh, there are uh, a few wrinkles that uh, could be added, but they're not necessary here. Uh, then Marx used this theory to examine the capital labor relation and answer the puzzle of how capitalists can appropriate uh, profit from free wage workers. Now, examining the relation between capital and labor, Marx argued that what the, what the worker sells to the capitalist is not exactly labor, it's the worker's capacity to work in exchange for a wage. And the capacity to work is called labor power. Now, uh, to distinguish this from labor, may seem like a, uh, you know, one more academic finding a distinction when uh, there isn't really one there. This is what they're paid to do. And that does happen with uh, intellectuals, academics. But in this case, this uh, small distinction will turn out to be very important. Uh, now, if labor power is bought and sold like a commodity, uh, then it has a value, the value of labor power, which will determine the wage, is determined by the hours required to produce it, which means the hours required to produce the commodities, food, clothing, housing, etc., to maintain the worker for a day. Now, let me mention that uh, I'm going to assume that pay is by the day, not by the hour. That's the way Marx does it in volume one of Capital. And in the late 19th century, it was common for wage workers to be paid by the day rather than by the hour. Uh, today, it's not common anymore, although it lives on in a few places. West Coast longshore workers still get a daily wage. I don't know why, it may be because their trade union has been uh, led by communists for a long time. Maybe they thought that this was the way to follow Marxist theory or something. I don't know the reason, but uh, it is just convenient to uh, assume workers are paid by the day. It makes it easier to see what's going on. I could do this by treating pay as by the hour, but it's less, uh, it will be less clear how it works. So I'll assume pay is by the day. So the capitalist buys a day's labor power from the worker, uh, pays a wage that is determined by the hours required to produce a day's worth of food, clothing, housing, etc. Then the production process begins. At work, the worker engages in labor. Labor is the process of producing useful goods or services, whereas labor power is the ability to engage in labor. Okay, they're closely related, but they're not the same. Uh, one is a process, the other is a commodity. Now, the simple example to, which will be the first step in showing how the capitalist is able to appropriate profit from capitalists. Suppose the workday is 10 hours. Then I have a question for you. How much value does a worker add to the output during the workday measured in hours? Would anyone like to take a stab at this question? if the workday is 10 hours. I'm looking at the chat. How much value would the worker create in that, in that workday? This is not a trick question. Some people are putting their answers in the chat. They think it's too obvious to actually say it. Uh, 10 hours, right. Uh, 
the value created during the course of the workday is equal to the length of the workday. Uh, now suppose the value of labor power, that is the hours required in the food industry, the clothing industry, et cetera, to produce the goods and services needed to uh, maintain a worker for a day is five hours. Then if you look at the slide, I have it up there, then 10 hours of value is created that will be realized when the goods are sold. Uh, only five hours for the value of labor power and the capitalist keeps the difference of five hours worth of value. The capitalist gets to keep the surplus value created. Thus, in symbols, if S sub D is the surplus value created per day by a worker, L sub D is the length of the workday, and V sub LP is the value of labor power, I hope variables that express what they mean, then the surplus per day is equal to the difference between the length of the workday and the value of labor power. Is there any question about this so far? If you have a question, feel free to raise it. I, I see David Diaz has stacked. Was that to, to answer my previous question? Um, yeah, that was for your uh, uh, previous question about. Ah, I missed it. Yeah. But just Sorry. to have, actually, I do have a question. Um, if ah, go ahead. Now that we're at it, I'm wondering how do you measure what's a, what Marx, I think, terms the socially necessary labor time to produce a commodity? Because I think, how, how, how does he know, or what was his analysis in terms of determining what's the socially necessary labor to produce a commodity and what labor time is necessary to produce? A workers' living living conditions, I guess, if that makes sense. Well, that's determined by the economy. So the 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 value of labor power is interpreted by Marx to be based on uh, the living standard of uh, the average living standard of workers in a given time and place, and uh, then uh, how many hours it takes to produce those goods and services necessary to uh, support the worker for a day. So it's something you could. Uh, in principle, measure if you had a lot of information about an economy. Uh-oh, someone asked an embarrassing question. Why is the value of labor power less than the length of the workday? You mean I haven't explained why there's surplus value yet? No, I haven't. Uh, I just started. And, you know, sometimes people, like when they when they hear this analysis, oh, I see the length of the workday is greater than the value of labor power. Uh, but uh, no, that's just like an accounting framework for uh, looking deeper into the question. So uh, that's what I'll do next. We'll look, we'll look deeper into the question. So, but let me just uh, identify the term that's used, uh, a relation of exploitation. <clears throat> in Marxist theory refers to a relationship in which one class appropriates the surplus produced by another class. Uh, you know, exploitation in everyday language means you're taking advantage of someone. It could be what one individual does to another. And in Marxist theory, it's a class relation. One class does the work and another one appropriates, takes the surplus. Okay, so we've identified a relation of exploitation and capitalism. Now, let's look behind these funny variables. The question is, why under capitalism is the value created by labor normally greater than the value of labor power? The point is that those two have different determinants, so they can be different, but why are they typically different? Well, the value of labor power is determined by two underlying factors, as I mentioned. First is uh, the set of goods consumed to reproduce the worker. Uh, it's a certain amount of food, clothing, housing, etc. Secondly, the hours required to produce those goods. The first one is sometimes called the real wage, which you can think of as like a, 
a list of so much food, so much clothing, so much housing, etc. And uh, the number two is determined by the productivity of labor in producing workers' consumption goods. How much labor is required for, to produce you know, one potato? Uh, how much labor is required to produce one shirt? Uh, that has to do with the technology of the economy. Uh, thus, we found that the appropriation of surplus value by the capitalists depends on the relations actually among three variables. The length of the workday, the real wage, and the productivity of labor in producing workers' consumption goods, which you can show actually depends directly and indirectly on the productivity of labor throughout just about the whole economy. But I still haven't answered the question. I'm still shucking and jiving here uh, because why should that relation be positive in capitalism? Why isn't it zero or even negative? Well, uh, that raises another question. Uh, what factors determine each of the following? The length of the workday, the real wage, and the productivity of labor. I would now like to do a short breakout room session now that people are probably starting to yawn and need to actively speak uh, for this to be a viable session. Uh, and uh, I am going to break, break the group down into groups of three. I'm not sure, let's see, what's the total here? Uh, I can't see 46 participants. Well, it'll almost work out right. I'll, one group might, might be four rather than three. I'm gonna break you down into groups of approximately three. And I would like you- um, David, Yeah. when you go to breakout rooms, automatically 10 people sign off, just so you know. Um, it, there's a drop off that happens when you go to breakout. So now we're at 42 from 46. Just by your saying, I don't the word care how many are actually. I'll just okay. uh, so now I'll it's just, I'll just define the saying. I'll just define the size of the breakout, <laughs> and and I threw out to make the discussion easier to uh, figure out what, what the heck I'm asking here. Uh, I listed some possible factors that might play a role: class power relations, technology, human biology, the role of the state. These are possible factors. So I'd like you to, for about uh, ten minutes, discuss. Uh, for each of those three, the length of the workday, the real wage, and the productivity of labor, which factors among those or possibly others that you think of uh, determine uh, how long the workday is, how high or how low the real wage is, and how high or how low the product productivity of labor is? Uh, is it clear what I'm asking? Does anyone want clarification? I'm looking at the chat now. I don't see any clarifying questions. Okay. It is clear, thank you, Jiro. Uh, I'm going to uh, go to uh, breakout rooms. Breakout rooms. I'm going to create, let's see if there, how many people are there, Carrington, about 42? Now there are 36. 36. Okay, I'm going to create 12 breakout rooms. Okay, and I'm going to pause the recording until we okay. come back. Okay, one, I'm going to give you about 10 minutes and please. So are the breakout rooms all closed yet? Been more than 60 seconds. So I have to X this out. Okay. Okay. Everybody back? Carrington, is that every can you see it? I can't see whether everybody's back. Everybody's back. Okay. If folks want, they can put into the chat things they came up with, but I'm going to give you uh, my view of this. Uh, let me get the PowerPoint working again. 
uh, in my view, uh, the factors that uh, operate are for length of the workday, uh, class power is the main factor, uh, although custom plays some role in that once a standard workday is uh, develops, it tends to persist. Uh, and I think the Marxist view is that workers and capitalists are not uh, completely uh, parallel or opposite in this. Capitalists want the longest possible workday. Marx argues workers don't want the shortest possible workday. They don't want to work one minute if they could, but they want a reasonable workday uh, that will not deplete their powers and exhaust them. For the second, workers' living standard is more complicated. Uh, and, and I think the way to think about this is that uh, there's a minimum and there's a maximum to uh, the real wage. The lowest it could be in a system that is viable over time is set by human biology primarily, it has to be enough to enable people to get the calories, the shelter they need, et cetera, uh, to survive. But uh, wages are, are way above that. Uh, there's also a maximum and the most that the average worker, we're talking about the average wage here for a whole economy, the most the average worker could get is all of it, all of what they produce after uh, deducting what's needed to replace the means of production that are used up. Uh, and of course they can never get that or the, they wouldn't be hired. Uh, but where it falls, and that's a really big gap between the technologically determined maximum and the biologically determined minimum it's class power, where the capitalists want to push it as low as they can. And the workers uh, don't necessarily want all of it, but they want uh, a decent living standard and perhaps one that rises over time. Uh, then, and technology does play a role. Uh, uh, if the, in India, no matter how well organized uh, workers were, they could not get a wage as high as that in Germany because Germany has a uh, much higher rate of productivity than India. And that does set a ceiling uh, on the wage. Then productivity of labor is usually thought of as mainly a matter of technology. Uh, as technology advances, as knowledge about how to produce advances, more is produced per hour throughout the economy. And you do see this over time in capitalist economies. However, there's also a role for class power in that, uh, in that productivity of labor is measured by the quantity of goods produced per hour of labor. But that is effect can be increased if capitalists can put pressure on workers to work faster or harder. And that's a matter of class power. So productivity of labor is mainly technology, but it's also class power. What about the state? The state plays a role in all of these. Well, at least in the first two, the length of the workday and the real wage. But uh, in the Marxist view, most Marxists view the state intervention in those matters as a reflection of the relative class power of capital and labor. Uh, if the state does things that can do things that reduce the wage, it can do things that increase the real wage, depending on the class power balance. Is there any question about this, this point? I just added in the chat, and I wanted just to confirm that it maybe is a factor is um, the number of available workers uh, slash unemployment versus number of available jobs. Is that a factor in these, I would assume. Yes, and you've anticipated by next oh. uh, slide after next. Good work. Okay. So let me let me get to that in a minute because that's a central argument of, of volume one of capital. So the deeper answer, the ultimate explanation, if you will, of surplus value is that capitalism is a system that endows capitalists with the power to keep the workday long enough the power to keep wages low enough and a guarantee of the right to introduce new technologies so as to keep labor productivity high enough so that a flow of surplus value goes to the capitalists. I don't know any less wordy way to sum that up. Uh, 
But that's, I think, the ultimate answer that lies behind that simple equation of surplus per day is equal to the length of the workday minus the value of labor power. Now, uh, I'll get to the role of unemployment in a moment, but first, uh, I take my obligation here uh, in leading this uh, session uh, to include covering the topics that were mentioned in the description. And that included the concepts of absolute and relative surplus value. Uh, so let me just briefly mention what those concepts are. Uh, Marx notes that the capitalists who are very in, interested in not just getting surplus value, but getting more of it, can increase it in two ways. One is uh, to extend the workday, which increases the total amount of value uh, being created. And Marx refers to that as a case of absolute surplus value, an increase in surplus value by extending the workday. So L sub D increases. The other way that capitalists, or another way that capitalists can increase surplus value is by reducing the variable, the, excuse me, the value of labor power uh, by, for example, improving technology. And that leads to an increase in surplus value. And he calls it relative surplus value because the total amount of value being created has not changed. Marx emphasized that over time, the most important way that capitalists increase surplus value is by introducing more powerful technologies. And that underlies capitalism's progressive mission of increasing human uh, productive power. Now, I have one more slide before I get to the point that was raised by uh, Matthew. Uh, and that is, I wanna draw some implications of this analysis. First, class struggle plays a major role in capitalism. Marxist theory of capitalism is not just a structural theory of impersonal structures that interact and lead to this or that. It is a theory in which class struggle plays a major role in the way the system works and in the direction of events. Uh, workers seek decent wages, decent working conditions, a reasonable workday. Capitalists seek lower wages, avoiding the expense of good working conditions and try to get a, max, a maximum possible workday. Second, the state matters. The state has a monopoly on coercive power and uh, capitalists would not have, would not be able to appropriate surplus value with no state. Capitalism is not just an economic system. Uh, sometimes people think of it as just an economic system, but that, that is not a helpful way to think of it, in my view. The state, uh, first of all, uh, defines property rights. It, it creates the uh, right of capitalists to own property and use it in certain ways that will uh, enable them uh, to get surplus value. Uh, the state will, may intervene in strikes on the side of one class or the other, usually the capitalist class. Uh, the state definitely matters. You know, if you imagined uh, some creatures from another world arriving on earth surreptitiously and viewing a workplace and they'd see all these people who are working hard and producing things that are then sold. And then they see some presumably heavy set person who is simply drawing revenue out of the enterprise. You know, they might be puzzled because they wouldn't know about the ownership relation that the state had defined. They might think, oh, there must be those people doing the work. They must be getting the benefit. Uh, well, not the way the state defines property rights in capitalism. The capitalist owns the workplace, owns the workers' labor power, purchased it fair and square, therefore owns whatever is produced. Third, ideology matters. Dominant ideas play a role in backing up the appropriation of surplus value. They justify capitalist profit. They seek to per persuade working people that the system is just. When, when, when one says that class struggle 
plays an important role. It's important, I think, to uh, realize that class struggle is not just in the economic realm. There's also class struggle in the political realm over the role of the state and in the realm of ideology over uh, the dominant ideas. I feel like I'm engaging in class struggle right here, although not necessarily the most important type. Won't by itself bring major change. Uh, and fourth, another implication of this analysis is that the working class plays the central role in the struggle to replace capitalism with socialism, since it is the workers who are producing the profit that flows to the capitalists and have ultimately the power to uh, prevent that from continuing. Now, someone wanted to know about unemployment. Well, uh, in chapter 25 of volume one of Capital, there is a very important analysis uh, in which Marx analyzes the role of unemployment. In, in this theory, unemployment is not just an unfortunate uh, outcome in capitalism, it plays a critical role in the way the system works. Uh, Marx used the term, the industrial reserve army to refer to unemployed workers, which over time came to be called the reserve army for short. It just refers to unemployed workers. A key determinant of the relative bargaining power of labor and capital is the unemployment rate. If the unemployment rate is high, workers will have very little bargaining power. You know, the old image of uh, a worker asks the boss for a raise and the boss draws the worker's attention to the window of the workplace and they look out and there at the entrance is a line of job seekers stretching far back. And uh, the boss says, uh, what is it you said you, you were insisting on? And, and the discouraged worker walks away realizing he can just be replaced. Uh, on the other hand, if there's no one at the factory gate and the worker says, you know, I, I got better options, <laughs> then workers have a much better chance of winning a pay increase. And this is not just an individual matter, this is a collective power matter. When the unemployment rate is low, workers as a group have a much greater ability to extract uh, concessions from capital. Uh, it's when workers strike, they can get temporary jobs easily to support themselves. They're hard to replace, et cetera. Uh, Marx identified a key mechanism from this, the reserve army mechanism. When the economy expands rapidly, the unemployment rate falls and eventually wages will begin to rise sufficiently to eat into profits. Workers will be able to claim a larger share of what they produce. The profit rate will fall. That leads to a recession since when the profit rate falls, capitalists individually uh, will decide I'm gonna wait until conditions improve and uh, I'll put my money in the bank in the meantime and wait for conditions to improve. The result of all the capitalists doing that at the same time is a recession and that means rising unemployment, the reserve army is restored and that competes the wage back down and the profit rate recovers. So what this says is that uh, this mechanism tends to keep labor weak enough over time to assure a flow of profit in the long run. This is a key mechanism. Uh, how does this relate to inflation, Elliot asks in the chat. I'll assume this was not a rhetorical question. Uh, this is a wrinkle that I'll just deal with for now by pointing out that if workers really have more bargaining power uh, when the unemployment rate gets low, then uh, they will be able to raise their wages faster than the rate of inflation. And the capitalists uh, won't be able to solve the problem of rising wages just by raising prices, particularly if there's competition in the system and particularly if there's import competition. But in a more advanced presentation, one would note that in contemporary capitalism, when workers get enough bargaining power at a very low unemployment rate, to start squeezing profits, there is an institution 
that represents the collective interests of the capitalist class that will intervene. Some of you at least probably know what that is. That's the Fed, the central bank, which will raise interest rates, which tends to bring a recession and increase unemployment. One of the major mandates, if not exactly written out in those terms uh, of the Federal Reserve. Uh, there was a wonderful study done of the uh, minutes of the US Central Bank from the 1950s when the steel industry was a major industry in the US economy. And the central bank minutes showed a discussion of their expectations about how big a wage increase the steel workers were likely to get in the upcoming negotiations so as to inform uh, whether they try and scrunch the economy or not. Uh, <clears throat> there have been some cases historically where uh, an alternative uh, to this uh, reserve army mechanism keeps wages in check, uh, but I won't go into that now. Some capitalist countries have had almost full employment under certain conditions, and not the US. The US economy that's only occurred during major wars, and like uh, World War II and the uh, Korean War, and in both of those cases, the government imposed wage price controls, particularly focusing on the wage end of it. Then uh, the last thing that I'll mention about the Marxist analysis of, of capitalism before briefly turning to other forms of oppression uh, has to do with accumulation. Capitalism has a powerful drive to accumulate, to use profits, part of the profits to reinvest, to increase production. It also involves uh, using part of the profits to introduce new and more powerful technologies which leads to growing profit in the future. Now, I have a question for you. Why do capitalists accumulate? You know, why do they want to get even more profits by accumulating? Why don't they, you know, why isn't the capitalist just happy with, with the large flow of profit they're getting? <clears throat> Anyone like to put stack in the chat and hazard an answer to why capitalists want to accumulate and get even more profits. Okay, here's a shy person who prefers to just use the chat, control, influence, greed. I see Matthew raised a yellow hand. Matthew. Um, a competition, if they don't accumulate, then other ones that do will be able to use their excess to lower prices until their competition goes out of business. Exactly. In Marxist theory, capitalists may be greedy, but Marxist theory doesn't explain the workings of the system based on psychological characteristics of individuals. Capitalism selects greedy people <laughs> to become capitalists. People who are not greedy probably wouldn't enjoy being capitalists that much, although there have been some non-greedy capitalists. I could tell stories. But the argument is a capitalist who decided, geez, I'm really rich. Look at all this profit flowing in. Why don't I just take it easy and live on my, my annual flow? Why should I take the trouble to figure out a good way to expand the firm? The argument is such a capitalist will soon become an ex-capitalist because others will do it. And that one will be competed out of business because generally the larger defeats the smaller and the more uh, up-to-date defeats the old tech in most, if not all, sectors of the economy. I wish I could get a 1960s washing machine technology, but that's another matter. Uh, and this, this has an important implication for a number of interests. It means that capitalism has a powerful drive to produce more and more goods and services independent of any human want or need for more commodities. Uh, and they have to be, people have to be persuaded to want more and more commodities. And this has obvious problems for minor considerations like the long-term survival of our species on this earth. Okay, I can see this is going on longer than I'd expected. Whoever heard of a professor who talked longer than he had intended? Uh, so let me just make some brief comments about other dimensions of oppression. Other forms, of oppression are part of capitalist society. Exploitation of labor is just one form of oppression and domination. Oppression 
Uh, and the capitalist era includes by race, by ethnicity, by nationality, by gender, there are still others. Later sessions of this uh, socialist uh, night school will take up uh, a number of those other forms. But for now, I'll just point out some connections between the exploitation of labor and the other forms. Each other form of oppression has its own particular features, its own causes, its own history, all predate capitalism. However, all of the other forms of oppression are affected by capitalism and play a role in capitalism. So running through it a little more quickly than I intended to, intended to because it's getting late, uh, we have uh, first the argument that, uh, uh, that if there are uh, different ethnic groups with unequal status in the system, that undermines the collective bargaining power of workers who will have difficulty uniting to demand higher wages and improved conditions. Uh, and there is uh, evidence of this happening in US history. There's evidence of employers consciously hiring a mix of ethnic, national, or racial groups, hoping that they won't be able to cooperate. Uh, there was a big advance in the US labor movement in the 1930s with the CIO, when the CIO unions were able to achieve solidarity between white and black workers in the core auto, steel, and electrical industries, longshoring. There is a contrary factor, Often there are contrary factors in capitalism that in some historical cases, oppressed racial or ethnic groups have had higher class consciousness than other groups, uh, which has played a role in victories of the labor movement. Uh, black workers in the US have played a leading role in some situations. Uh, some immigrant groups in US history, uh, German immigrants to, uh, Wisconsin uh, built very powerful unions. Uh, Jewish immigrants from Eastern Europe to New York City built powerful labor unions in New York City. So there are some, some contrary tendencies. Then another connection is that sometimes capitalists can get extra profit from specially oppressed parts of the working class. Black and Hispanic workers have less bargaining power due to special oppression, which forces them to work for low wages and under bad working conditions. Mainstream economics argues that when a particular job is undesirable or dangerous, well, that's resolved by the market in that employers will have to pay higher wages to get people to do such work. Well, the presence of oppressed racial and ethnic groups that have no good options relieves capitalists of the obligation to do what mainstream economics says they do, which is to pay higher wages. Usually the more oppressive jobs pay lower wages <laughs> rather than higher wages because they're, they're foisted off on groups with no good options. Then there is also the case of enslavement in the capitalist era. Early capitalism brought a, uh, a vast expansion of, the, of an archaic slave system in the early uh, British colonies in North America and in the US. Uh, and there is an analysis of how that happened, that capitalist industry needed plantation crops from warmer parts of the US. And, and it was impossible to use wage labor on plantations for various uh, conjunctural reasons. Uh, and Africans were enslaved as the cheapest way to fulfill that role. Then there is the case of extermination. Capitalism chiefly aims to find labor power to exploit, but in some cases it comes upon people who do not make suitable wage laborers. And when capitalism expands into new regions where indigenous people had pre-existing uh, economic systems, pre-capitalist systems, they could not be lured into wage labor and they were not suitable uh, for work as slaves either typically because they could escape too easily and they occupied valuable land. And the result in a number of parts of the world, including around here was extermination, including in Massachusetts where I'm speaking. Then there is the case of patriarchy. 
meaning male domination of females. It appears gender is left out of the basic Marxist analysis. It is there, it was just not made apparent by Marx. It's there in the background, at least partially. Uh, patriarchy predates capitalism, capitalism reshapes it. And one way you can see the connection is about the value of labor power. Now, I was going to uh, raise this as a question, but given that it's 8.15, uh, and the answer is pretty obvious. Uh, I'm going to just uh, uh, point out that labor power itself is produced in families, in state institutions, in religious institutions, in nonprofit educational institutions, primarily in families. The value of labor power includes the commodities to reproduce the children, since this is a self-reproducing over time kind of theory. Uh, and the domestic laborers, those who work in the household must be reproduced as well. So the value of labor power includes the commodities for everyone in the household. And in the traditional family, so-called with a female wife who does domestic labor and a male husband who engages in wage labor, while the capitalist does not pay a wage to the domestic laborer, nevertheless, you can show that profit, the amount of profit the capitalist gets is affected by the relations in the family. And that changes in what the domestic laborer does in the home can increase or decrease the amount of profit that the capitalist will get. So there's an indirect impact uh, <clears throat> The uh, domestic laborer does receive an in-kind wage through the wage of the wage worker and uh, does contribute indirectly to the creation of surplus value. In, and you can show that in the theory. And uh, that kind of analysis can be used to help shed light on the mass entry of women into wage labor in the decades following World War II, an important change in the form of uh, gender relations and patriarchy. Then finally, I'll mention imperialism. The profit drive leads capitalists to seek to export goods, invest in other countries, find natural resources located around the world. The key point of Marxist analysis about this is that capitalists seek not just trade, but domination of export markets to maximize the amount of profit they can get. They seek to dominate places to invest since the exercise of power determines the amount of profit that can be extracted. They seek not just to purchase raw materials, but to uh, control their uh, development. Capitalists bring their state with them when they move outside of their home country. Imperialism. I think is best understood as the economic and political domination of one country by the ruling class of another aimed at extracting economic benefits for the ruling class. In Lenin's famous book about imperialism, he gives a definition and that's not it, but if you read, read it carefully, there's an implicit definition and that's the implicit definition of imperialism since he says things like ancient Rome was imperialist and he didn't think it was monopoly capitalist, which was the, uh, main definition he focused on. According to Marxist theory, imperialism is inherent in capitalism and it gives rise to national oppression and to exploitation of uh, all classes in, a, in another country. It also gives rise to wars. And one can argue that the role of capitalism in bringing imperialist domination and war may well have created more socialists than the exploitation of labor per se. It was a major force driving the growth of socialist and communist movements in the 20th century. So finally, concluding comment, which will, as I promised, be brief. The Marxist analysis of the exploitation of labor is useful for understanding all forms of exploitation and oppression in the ca contemporary capitalist era and forming a political strategy for fighting against all forms of oppression 
while moving toward replacing capitalism with socialism. Okay, that's what I had to say. Uh, uh, Carrington, uh, is there time for people to raise some questions? It's 8.20 or do you want to, what, what do you want to do at this point? Um, I think we're good for seven minutes. It's 8.18 right now, maybe till 8.25, even 8.27. Okay, the floor is open for questions and comments. Elliot. Um, <clears throat> so my question is about um, the other forms of exploitation and oppression. So like we are saying here on this slide that the analysis is useful for understanding those other forms of exploitation that you talked about in the capitalist era. But how do you understand those forms of exploitation that exist in societies that aren't capitalist? Like, how do we understand the fact that other forms of exploitation exist even in societies that are not capitalist? So, Jazz, do you have uh, an example so I'll know what you have in mind? Like, um, I don't know, caste systems or gender oppression that has existed in like pre capitalism? Well, I, you know, <clears throat> I think the Marxist concept of exploitation is best understood as the appropriate class appropriation of a surplus. And that means it can be used to analyze uh, other systems in capitalism, which are based on class appropriation of a surplus. So uh, that would apply to, for example, feudal systems, uh, slave systems, uh, uh, perhaps certain other forms such as uh, sharecropping systems, which uh, have been a kind of a semi-feudal form of class exploitation in US history. But I think my, my understanding of Marxist theory says that there are other forms of oppression that are just as important, which take a different form from class exploitation. So there is a question whether uh, gender inequality and oppression is best understood as a form of uh, exploitation of appropriation of a surplus or through a different framework. And there's a lot of debate about that with some feminists arguing that it really can be understood as a form of exploitation. Others arguing that it has different features from that of class uh, exploitation. I mean, my take is that, uh, you know, forms of oppression that are, that don't fit into the exploitation framework are not thereby less important or less relevant to the struggle against capitalism and all forms of oppression. Uh, it's just exploitation is a central concept for understanding the capital labor relation and the capitalism per se, which uh, has an important dynamic of development that we need to understand. Um, David, Thank do you, you want to? Close the PowerPoint um, so that we can have the full screen. Sure. I, I thought yeah. people might want to refer to slides. That's why I left it. So I'll stop. Oh, that's now. a good point. Um, okay, gone. I, I see Matthew has a question in the chat. Okay, Matthew. Okay, you want me to read it? <laughs> uh, if the labor theory of value has problems, where does that leave Marxist theory? This is a major topic of debate among Marxist economists. Uh, and there are many different positions on it. Uh, my position, you may, I gave you implicitly, which is uh, in my view, uh, the labor theory of value is not an accurate uh, description of the prices at which commodities are exchanged. Neither by the way, is the dominant neoclassical theory of uh, value. Uh, neither accurately uh, explains actual uh, exchanges. All theories of exchange are simplifications. And in my view, the labor theory of value is a convenient device for showing uh, the basis of exploitation. But you may have noticed that 
I went from that to an argument about class power relations, uh, technology. Uh, I think the core of the Marxist claim about exploitation is conveniently presented based on the labor theory of value, but is not dependent on it, accurately describing the rates of exchange among commodities. I think the real story is it focuses your attention on the key factors of class power, technology, biology, nature plays a role, which I didn't get to. Uh, but there are still other answers that have been uh, given. Anyone else have a question? Carrington. Oh, wait, Matthew, why don't we keep, go to Matthew next? Since Carrington, you are you talk to me all the time. Sure. Yeah, whichever, sorry. I, I don't even know um, if my question's really fully a question. I think what I wanna ask is, do you feel if um, in like modern, the modern day version of capitalism, if everyone uh, fits neatly into an either capitalist or laborer, like, you know, bucket container? Um, or is there more spectrum and more like, cause you know, that's my question, I guess. Yeah. Is, does yeah, everyone fit into those that, two? That, no, that's, a, that's a big, it's a big question. I mean, society has never been made up only of capitalists and workers. Uh, not when Marx wrote and not today, although workers are a larger share today than they were when Marx wrote. I mean, there were tons of peasants when Marx wrote. Uh, <clears throat> but their the usual view today is there are four main classes. Uh, there's uh, capitalists who own enough means of production to live on the income from it. There are uh, workers, wage workers, those who uh, are dependent on a wage or salary for their survival. And uh, they, that second group does make up about uh, 60%, 60 to 70% of what is called the economically active population, leaving out domestic laborers and so forth. Uh, but then there are two middle-class groups. There is the, the old middle class of people who own a small business that is mainly dependent on their own family's labor. Uh, so they're neither capitalists nor workers. They produce something for sale and they live on the revenue, uh, but they're not dependent on wage appropriating a surplus. And then there's the new middle class, which is uh, people who have some kind of a managerial or professional position that <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> is, it makes them different. <clears throat> you know, managers are actually agents of the capitalists and <clears throat> Some professionals are really, you know, if they're independent professionals, they're kind of akin to the old middle class, you know, the lawyer who hangs out a shingle uh, <clears throat> and works on her own. Uh, those are the main group. There are others, you know, there are criminals who have their own class structure, you know, capitalists, <laughs> workers, independent producers. <clears throat> uh, and there are a few other groups you could identify, but, <clears throat> I think you know wage workers are a big majority in, in, in the meaning, you know, wage workers, they don't have to be producing physical goods. They can be producing services. Marx never distinguished goods and services. They're equally products of capitalism. Uh, <clears throat> there are some, there is an argument about unproductive workers who, who, uh, <clears throat> who aren't really contributing to surplus value, but that's a wrinkle that I didn't get into. Thank you. That was great. Thank you. Carrington, did you still want to ask something? Um, you know, I see Peter has something in the chat. <clears throat> well, I, <clears throat> uh, as I said before, <clears throat> uh, you know, if someone works for Google, Google, Google is uh, selling things, it's making profits. It, it comes from its workers. There is a, there is one complication. There are some people who, uh, who argue that uh, some tech companies are appropriating surplus value from their consumers. And this is a new area of uh, debate among Marxists. I know Marxists both in the US and in China 
who are uh, writing research papers about this topic, whether you can think of, uh, you know, the people who use the services of Facebook, et cetera, as actually uh, contributing surplus value to the owners, but it's unresolved. I don't know the answer to it. I don't have a quick opinion. On. There are a few things I don't have quick opinions on. Um, what I was gonna ask, but I think we're out of time is just the part about nature that you didn't get to, um, because that's an important part of Marxist theory, right? Is what, which part? Um, the part about the role nature plays or oh, Marxist nature. theory in relation to nature. <clears throat> Well, it plays a number of roles. Uh, nature, you know, affects the uh, production of surplus value in various ways because natural materials are used in production, land, air, water, et cetera. Uh, but uh, particularly important is that uh, capitalism uh, creates a powerful tendency to destroy nature. And there's a whole analysis of this. And particularly in the era of global climate change, this becomes one of the major contradictions of capitalism that emerges from the accumulation drive and from the pursuit of profit, which together uh, lie behind the powerful tendency to uh, uh, alter the climate in ways that will make uh, hard for our civilization such as it is to survive. Um. Thank you, David. That was such a nice summary and what a cliffhanger for our eco social <laughs> class coming up in the spring. Um, thank you. That was, it was so wonderful to have you, David. And um, do you have any closing remarks, any sort of um, places you want to point us to, to um, further our education on this topic? Well, I guess the only other thing I'll mention, I mean, thank you for inviting me. Uh, I. Uh... I, I uh, miss these kind of interactions. I don't have enough of them in the era of COVID. Uh, and uh, one topic I didn't get to, it was not on my, in my mandate is that capitalism comes in different varieties and uh, sometimes its form changes radically. And I think we're in a period when capitalism is likely to change its form either to become worse or to become somewhat better. And we're in such a moment and that's something worth uh, analyzing and looking into. It's something I've been working on. So nice to meet you all. Okay, thank you so much. And um, now Mia is going to share a, just a few announcements with us, um, including links to today's PowerPoint and contact information for David. So please stand by. Awesome, thank you again so much um, to the committee and to David for giving such an amazing talk. Um, I'll just run through these quickly because I know folks um, are at time and we want everyone to get on with the rest of their night. Um, and Carrington, are you good to, to post the links in the chat as we go? Okay, and then um, the first thing was just the PowerPoint. Uh, David, would you like for us to just share that directly here in the chat or? Yeah, yeah, that'd be fine. Okay, awesome. So we're going to go ahead and post the link so you guys can access the slides, which will be super useful for our future reference. Um, David's email just from the PowerPoint, um, we can also post it in the chat if that's okay. Um, if yep. you guys have further questions for discussion for anything else, um, please do attend our next session. It's going to be really great on elections in the state, um, which is also very relevant to a lot of the things we discussed today. It's going to be with our cadre members uh, and um, election builders, Michael Kanukin and Tasha Van Aken. It should be a really, really great conversation. So be sure to RSVP right now so that you already have it in your calendar. Um, starting today, um, all North Brooklyn DSA members in good standing um, who want to um, contribute to our member-driven democracy in DSA um, can nominate themselves to join the branch organizing committee. Um, and you can fill that out. Um, We'll post the link in the chat as well. And those are due on the 17th on Sunday by midnight. So if you would like to step up into a leadership position, this is a great way to do that. Um, you can find our recorded sessions from past uh, night schools at the link that's gonna be posted. It's on our YouTube. So you guys can access um, all of our previous night schools and this one will be posted there as well. Um, please join DSA. If you're not a DSA member, it's the place to be uh, to help build socialism and take down capitalism, the system that we just talked about. So please become an official member. If you're on the fence, talk to one of us. Um, we're NBK Socialists. We'll post that in a second too. And also, if you are a member, 
of NYC DSA, but don't pay chapter dues, we highly, highly recommend that so that we can actually build more power in our localized um, uh, chapters, such as opening an office and furthering our organizing through, through separate chapter dues. That's a great way to do that as well. Um, and yeah, contact us. We already got that there. Thank you so much. <laughs>